Do you have a posse, a small group of people with whom you might make what John Lewis would call good trouble? Stir apart a little, encourage each other to step to the edge a little, make plans, collaborate, remind each other that you're awesome and you're doing great. One of my favorite posses are three women who have now all been on this show. They're all professors. They're all thinking about how we humans act at our best and at our worst, and they're all terrific. There's Dolly Chug. She's the author of The Person You Mean to Be and also A More Just Future. There's Katie Milkman, who's author of How to Change, and now Madupe Ekinola, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Now, I know Dolly, Katie, and Madupe are friends, but they're not just that. Their co-written New York Times op-ed titled Professors Are Prejudiced Too was one of the 20 most emailed, read, tweeted articles the weekend that it was published. So the question I've got for you is, who are you making good trouble with? I mean, as always, it's a question for me. I'm trying to figure that out myself, but maybe you're thinking about that too. So welcome to Two Pages with MBS, the podcast where brilliant people read the best two pages from a favorite book, a book that has moved them, a book that has shaped them. This is the perfect episode to be kicking off 2024 because Madupe Ekinola is a professor at Columbia Business School. She's a teacher of leadership to first year MBA students, and she's the host of the TED Business Podcast. She's also a life coach to Thor, God of Thunder. Okay, not exactly, but the focus of Madupe's research is stress, and she actually worked with Chris Hemsworth, the Australian actor who played Thor in the movies, about his own stress management when they filmed a National Geo series together called Limitless. Just imagine her, put down the hammer, Chris, put the hammer down. Madupe is a native New Yorker, but her parents hailed from West Africa. I have parents who were 100% focused on education. And the idea that you immigrate to the U.S. to be able to give yourself and your family and your children the best education possible and the best life possible. And so being a child of immigrants for me has meant being a child who loves education. It's one of the great human acts. It dates back millennia. Parents leaving home to give their children a better life. In their late 20s, they left everything to come to the States to be able to give me and my sisters all that we have now. And so I just really respect and admire them. And I have a respect and admiration for all immigrants for, you know, just being bold and courageous and brave. It wasn't just courage and bravery that helped Madupe's family settle and succeed in a new country. Mentors, supporters people who kind of guide you and teach you all there is to know about the new culture, the new environment, the new experience. I credit, you know, going to the schools that I went to because my parents had a mentor whose daughter went to the schools we went to. And they asked her, well, you know, your daughter's amazing. How'd she go? To-? And it was through Auntie Sandra's mentorship that my parents learned so much and uh, got a chance to acclimate a bit better to the U.S. when they came here in the late 60s. Now, I'm curious about stress. It's a fascinating topic. I mean, unlike Chris Hemsworth, I don't have to figure out what it means to be a movie star and a Norse god. But, you know, I've got my own things going on. But stress is one of those words that means everything and nothing. So I I really wanted to know how Madupe defined it. There are a couple of definitions that I love to use. One is stress can be a situation where there is kind of a constraint or a challenge that is uncertain, but also important. Right. So think about that. Most of the times you're stressed, it's because there's some type of challenge and you're not sure about how it's going to go. Right. And so that's one way to define it. Another way that I also find to be useful is, um, is that it's a situation where the demands of the situation exceed your resources to cope. Right. So there might be some danger associated with what you're doing. There's some uncertainty, again, that word uncertainty coming up. Um, And you don't know if you have the knowledge and abilities, the disposition, the kind of external support to 
to to make up for those demanding things that are happening. So when you when those demands exceed the resources, you feel yeah. very stressed. <laughs> And the little I know about neuroscience is I think, you know, when you're faced with uncertainty, you kind of basically move into a fight or flight response. That's your brain going, look, you're not sure what's happening here. Yeah. You know, deal with it, <laughs> attack or run away. Um, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I suspect you've got a more nuanced understanding of other options to respond to stress. How do you help people to start navigating stress in a way that might be serve them better. Right. Yeah. You know, your, your, your mind and your body are prepared for action when you <laughs> encounter a stressor. Yeah. And the question that you should always ask yourself or that I often ask myself is, okay, um, I find myself in this situation. Let me take stock of how I'm feeling right now. Mm. And because uh, just noticing, one thing is just noticing, is my heart pumping really hard? And yeah. if it is, if it's beating really quickly, then maybe I need to take some deep breaths to slow it down. Right. What's my mind telling me? Is my mind telling me, you can't do this, you can't do this, you don't have it in you? And if so, can I remind myself of similar situations where I did have it in myself uh -huh. and where I did overcome it? Can I recall all of the triumphs that I've had yeah. that gives me then the energy to overcome this stressor? So a lot of it is shifting your mindset about the stress that you're facing so that you can realize that like not all stress is bad. I've been an experienced stress and I've been able to rise to the occasion. And that yeah. doesn't mean that there haven't been stressful situations where I've buckled under it. That happens, but more often than not, the thriving ensues because I have all it takes to deal with it in most situations. I just need to remind myself of that. So I love that you're pointing to two things. You're pointing to a kind of physical, visceral response. <laughs> oh, look, what's my heart doing? Oh look, oh, look, my palms, what are my palms doing? But also a head response, you know, kind of what's the story yeah. that's going on in my head? Look, I aspire to be yes. that wise to notice that stuff in the moment, Madrupe, but you know, honestly, often under stress, I'm kind of so hunkered down on survival. It, I, I, I miss the moment. <laughs> which adds to more stress. Mm. Do, do you have any mm -hmm. insight around what it takes to build this capacity to take a beat and notice what's going on? If that taking a beat is so important to help thinking about how you, you, you address what's in front of you. Yeah. You know, um, for me, some of that has come through kind of meditation Uh huh because that forces me to slow down and to kind of observe in retrospect and in the present moment how I've dealt with situations. Right. I also think a healthy dose of friendships and relationships where someone can tell you, ooh, you're a little stressed right now. So that even if you don't notice it, they're like, mm, you just ate that whole bag of potato chips. <laughs> Did you notice that? So sometimes having friends yeah. and others who notice for you then can help you in um, noticing for yourself and in diagnosing for yourself. Uh, so I think some of this is a collective process, but you do have to be still and care to notice to be able to then notice. Yeah. So it's in, in, in part of this is also building the muscle. You have to right. build the muscle. I study stress partially because I've been stressed all my life, right. you know, and right. um, they say research is me search. And <laughs> I have learned that, the more I practice what I preach, the better I get at it. And that doesn't mean that I will always nail it. No, we're, yeah. we're human. You know, we all don't rise to the occasion as much as we could. But if you practice and you notice, then you get better each time. Do you think it's possible to reframe any stressful situation as an opportunity for growth and an opportunity to thrive rather than an opportunity to be broken? Or is it just kind of sometimes you can, sometimes you can't? My natural instinct says, yes, that you can view any stressor as an opportunity. Right. Because um, it might be the toughest situation in your life. Yeah. But being able to see how you get through it 
is so incredibly powerful. And it's about shifting your mindset about it. Now, that is not to say that you should say, oh, this is a, this stress is good. The, the example that always comes to me is a sick parent or a sick child. Like mm. that is not a good situation. That is painful. That is hard. That is emotional. It's draining. Right. But what you can say is, I'm growing from this. I'm yeah. learning how to, you know, deal with pain. I'm learning how I can bring what I learned here to another situation where someone else is sick or when someone else is dealing with an an, an elderly parent. Yep. So every stressful situation is an opportunity to build those resources in you to overcome the next stressful experience. That's how I like to think of it. Yeah, I mean, that's helpful for me to hear. I, you know, I'm, I'm actually here in Australia at the moment because I have an elderly sick parent and I've been in my childhood bedroom for four months, maybe five months now. <laughs> so there's a whole lot of reframing wow. that goes on on a daily basis here to uh, kind of breathe yeah. my way through yeah. some of that. Um, but Jopa, I know. Right. And, and I think sometimes we, the, the um, sorry, but the dominant perspective is that we should like deny it. No, it's not bad. No, no, no. It's fine. I'll be fine. No. Part of stress is like acknowledging it yeah. and accepting that it exists and then um, preparing yourself for how to address it in a way that is adaptive, that's helpful, that doesn't kill you <laughs> in some ways. Well, let me ask you about the, the process of acknowledging it, because part of the challenge for me is untangling what's happening. Because, um, you know, there's one part of me that can, can catastrophize, <laughs> you know, I'm just kind of build up a disaster yeah. that's happening and, yeah. and make up drama and stories and impending disaster and all sorts of things. And that's not always that what's actually happening. It's, mm -hmm. it's a reaction to some smaller right. things that are often there. Uh, I'm wondering how you keep a clearer eye to understand exactly what's going on so you can better understand what you're seeing. Again, this, some of this goes back to noticing. It's just, that yeah. sounds so, noticing sounds so obvious or so whatever. Yeah. But I just, I feel, I feel like that's really the first step. You, when you start catastrophizing, you need to sit there and be like, Ooh, huh. Mm. I just catastrophized. <laughs> and also accept it non-judgmentally. This is going back to the mindfulness yeah. work and, you know, in, in the meditation piece is just, this is acknowledgement means this is what it is. Yeah. It is what it is. And let me be present with what it is. Right. And then once I acknowledge what it is, then I can say, what might I do differently? Or not even judge it in that way. Maybe just say, okay, this is just how I'm feeling. And I feel like catastrophizing and it's okay to catastrophize right now. Yeah. And guess what? Maybe tomorrow I won't feel like catastrophizing. And maybe it's the catastrophizing that helps me breathe better. Yeah. And just being with it. And, and you know, the thing that gets me is that ever since we were kids, you scrape your knee and someone tells you, don't cry, you're okay. You're not yeah. okay, you scraped your knee. Yeah. So we have this automatic, we want to say, it's okay. It's not, no, 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 no. Deny it. No, acknowledge it. Scrape my knee and it hurts. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I scrape my knee and it hurts. Tomorrow, it won't hurt as much. Yeah. And so um, it's some one aspect of meditation is remembering that everything is impermanent and that how I feel today is not necessarily how I'll feel tomorrow. How I feel this second is not how I'll feel in five seconds. Sure. And when you realize that, you just feel so much lighter, so much lighter, or at least I do. Madhupe, you said that part of the art of noticing, and I love this as a theme, which is, you know, one way to start to understand stress is just to notice, you know, what, what ha what's, the, what's the trigger and what's yeah. the reaction and just starting to see that. Um, yeah. But having, having friends or other people around you who can notice in those times where you don't notice. And, you know, I, I don't know you, yeah. but um, I, you know, I've talked, I know Dolly Chug, who's, a little who's part of this podcast yes and she's like she talks with such affection about you and about katie milkman and it makes me want to ask this how, how it's, it's a kind of related question i think how do you find great collaborators people you can lean on and trust i mean is it just a lack of the 
you, know, you bump into Dolly in the canteen and you're like, you're awesome. Or uh, how do you, how do you nurture relationships like that? Would you pay? Oh, I think that's such an important question. And I feel like we need to just create more time to be curious about people and get to know them. Our, my relationship with Dolly and Katie kind of developed organically. We had the same graduate school advisor. And so we'd bump into ah, each other right. here and there and at uh, non-lab meetings and things like that. And we just would have conversations. And we were all willing to be vulnerable with each other mm. about things and to have real conversations. I always felt like I could be real with them. I didn't have to put on a persona and I could be open and honest. And that's really what started this amazing sisterhood that I'm so grateful for. Yeah. And when I think of some of my closest relationships, they're relationships where we're all okay being vulnerable with each other right? and being open to what the other person has to say and listening. They're excellent listeners. right? So um, that's, I think, a piece of how to nurture these types of friendships. We also find make the time. We we also make the time to see each other, talk to each other, be on Zoom together, whatever, yeah. even though our schedules are incredibly busy. Yeah. Because we respect and admire and appreciate each other. I mean, part of your the focus of your work is organizations and organization behavior and development and and the dynamics of those those big places to work. And it's risky being vulnerable in places like that. And there's this tension, I feel, which is, look, on the one hand, I'm trying to build relationships that have a, a, a tensile strength to them and a resilience and a joy and a kind of connection. And uh, on the other hand, mm -hmm. there's quite a lot at risk in terms of putting the, you know, opening yourself up, particularly in a work environment where there are politics and power games that can play out. Yeah. What's your thought on how you navigate the, that, those tensions to succeed in organizational life? I mean, how do you teach your first year MBAs around this is, this is how you, this is how you might succeed? Well, I think a critical part is being authentic. And I think we all have a, an internal compass where when we see somebody, you can tell if they're a person that you'd want to know better. Right. There's uh, something that goes something. off in you that yeah. says like, Ooh, Ooh, that's my kind of person, you, <laughs> you yeah. know? And it doesn't have to be the person that's this, you know, it doesn't have to be someone who's the same race, the same, but you just know it. We mm. all know. And so I always encourage my students to act on that instinct. Mm. Be courageous afterwards, even if it's somebody who's a professor or, or whatever, or someone who's very different from you. Be courageous and say, hey, I loved what you said. I would love to talk more. Right. Um, express gratitude. Mm. Express appreciation. You know, do a favor for somebody. Get advice for someone. These are my, my colleagues and I call this GAFA, develop your GAFA, because that is one of the ways in which you can get to know people better when you find someone you click with. Right. And so I encourage my students to say kind things after something has touched them, to do kind things to people. Right. And I think their relationships just continue to develop and flourish through that because we all know what it feels like to be appreciated and how right. that just changes your experience and changes how you view somebody. So express appreciation more, express gratitude more. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of the rest follows. You had an interesting phrase. Was that building your gaffle? I don't know what that means. So I, I said gratitude, um, Oh, acknowledgements, nice favors and advice. Got it. So if you're grateful for things, you acknowledge <laughs> yeah, yeah. people when they've done great things, you do favors for them and get and give advice. Yeah. That's your gaffa. And the more that. you build those in an organization, the more, um, the stronger the relationships you will have. I was uh, I was going down the line of uh, I, I missed the acronym, so I was going down the line of I think a gaffer is somebody who's a woodworker on a film set. So I'm confused, but that that I got it now. Uh, hey, Madupa, was that there sounds a... like such a kind of British type of word. Yeah, you know that it's some <laughs> exactly. that gaffer. You know, <laughs> well, that's right. The other thing a gaffer is is the um, 
the manager of a soccer team in England. It's like, I'll oh, go and talk to the gaffer and he'll tell me Is what that to right? do. Oh. Yeah. They say you're, you're spot on. It's a very British term. Yes. Yes. <laughs> G-A-F-A, just an acronym. So I'm wondering if there's a, a, a moment, a story in your life where somebody has made an acknowledgement and it's made a difference for you. It's kind of struck a real chord. Um, there are so many moments like that in my life. Yeah. So I will focus on the most recent, which is, as I said, I'm a leadership professor. I teach first year MBAs, how to be more ethical, thoughtful, yeah. motivational, inspiring leaders. And I do have one session where I ask people to bring in something from their workplace that is um, representative of the culture of that workplace. Oh, and Dangerous. one <laughs> of my students, yes, as because it's very important to understand that there are different like symbols and different right. um, artifacts that represent our organizations that we have all over, and we don't really code them as kind of things that really help us in building culture. Yeah. I have a trans student and she brought in something that she created in the organization that kind of represented her vision of the organization being more welcoming to right. um, to people with different um, sexual orientations and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time in the class that she came out to her classmates. Right. And afterwards, she said, you know, thank you for creating that environment that allowed me to share in a way that was authentic and that allowed me to share something that was weighing heavily on me because I didn't know how and I didn't know when, but I knew I was going to do that at some point. Yeah. So the fact that she acknowledged that creating that safe space meant so much to her, yeah. just... I, it warmed my heart in a way that I have not been touched like that in a while. Really, really special moment that I could do that because yeah. I like to model behavior that I want my students to exhibit with each other. Yeah, and for yeah. her to say that to me made me, just brought me so much joy <laughs> and made me say, there is a reason I'm here and I'm thankful for this moment. I mean, if I, you're working in organizational culture and organization leadership, there's there's just a lot of BS about leadership that, you know, has been around yeah. for a long, long time, you know, and uh, you yeah. know, it, it's often kind of like, here's my old white dude's perspective on it because it worked for me. Um, I'm wondering, mm. you know, as a first generation New Yorker, as a woman of color, as a woman with a psychology, as a background, what do you feel are the new truths about leadership? Hmm. Ooh, that's good. I feel like our old model of leadership that came from the older white men um, was focus on your work and the emotions and all that, whatever, put that aside. <laughs> exactly. And just do, do, do. Mm. And the new model says bring your full self. Bring those emotions, bring that performance, bring that mind, bring that, bring it all right. because all of it matters and you are a whole person. And so I often say like, I want to normalize tears in organizational environments. That doesn't mean you go to every meeting, like crying and boohooing. <laughs> it just right. means that it's not a, <gasps> when somebody brings an emotion like tears, cause they yeah. were happy or sad about something. We were given all of these emotions. We are who we are because these are supposed to be used and to be manifested. And so why are we suppressing so much of us? And I think that if we bring more of our full selves, our organizations will be more human because that's yeah. what we have to bring our humanity. And um, so, yeah, that's what I think we need to bring more with. And my, my, some of my, my, teaching assistants who have worked with me over the years, they always kind of classify how the different professors lead. Right. And they're like, they often say like, you lead with love. <laughs> you know, I lead with my heart because my heart yeah. is an emotion that I bring to everything I do. Why should I leave that out? Why should my students, I feel like every student should be able to see that I see the divine in them yeah. and that I love them. I feel love in my heart for them being brought in my life. And that might sound weird to some other professors, but 
that's me and that those are my emotions and that's how yeah. I feel and I'm bringing that to my workplace. <laughs> I hear that. Unapologetically. Yeah. Now here's the here's the dilemma I have with what you've just said. Cuz I'm banging on the drum about people-centered business and organizations forever it feels like. Um but the cynic in me goes yeah, but if I, I get people to bring their full self to work, I just have more to exploit, you know, and that's, that's using kind of harsh mm -hmm. words, but there's, there's one way, which is like, look, if I'm getting all of you, then I'm getting all of you and I'm, and is that a fair trade for the salary that I'm paying you? So I, I don't know if you've you've ever wrestled with this dilemma, which is like the risk of being authentic, the risk of bringing your whole self to work is that there's just left for things outside work because work is taking it all now. Right. Right. Well, so this is so what's important about what you said is I can give my all but still have my boundaries. Mm. Giving my all doesn't mean uh, allowing myself to be exploited. It means giving my full self and knowing when nice. enough is enough, too much is too much and feeling confident and comfortable saying, Hey, no, that, that, that's not right. That doesn't work for me. So just as much as I can say, this does work for me and this is great. I can say, no, this doesn't work for me. And so that's one thing that I think these days, many of us are struggling with. What are my boundaries? Yeah. And, um, I think bringing your full self means also knowing and exercising that muscle of saying no, and that muscle of knowing what your boundaries are. Yeah. And, um, I often say kind of like shame on me if I allowed somebody to, to make me give more than I was willing to give shame on me. I, I have that as well, Madupe. And then there are also times where I've gone, look, I've, there are times where I've definitely given more than I want, where my boundaries have been crossed. And, and like, I'm a smart, educated, self-aware, pretty confident person. And I, I have been screwed over. <laughs> And I'm like, it's because of the power dynamic. I'm like, it's really hard for me to to resist my boss's boss because that's just the, the hierarchy of the organization. Yeah. Are, are human-centered businesses, do they have to be built that way from the start or can you retrofit old organizations to have some of this more human-centered, people-centered sense to who they are? I think one of the reasons why I teach leadership is that I think that leadership can be a learned behavior. There are aspects yeah. of it that you can learn. And um, that's why I believe in it. And that's why I teach it. So I think that often our worst leaders weren't taught any better. Yeah. And so it's incumbent on us to teach them what we need mm. to be able to help them to become more effective love that. and to help them not exploit and whatever. Now that's not to say there aren't going to be people who are going to exploit. They yeah. are, they, there are always going to be people who are going to do that, but I think there are enough in this world who are not. And so it's a combination of teaching people how to be more effective leaders that aren't exploitative, but also recognizing if you're in an environment where they are trying to exploit you and leaving. But one thing also came to my mind when you um, asked that question, yeah, which was it, when you said about your bosses, bosses, whatever, and all that. It's so important to have relationships that can help you in pushing back and help you in knowing your boundaries with even more senior people because they can provide you great cover in times where you need it, um, in times where you do feel like your boundaries are, um, aren't being respected. So this goes back to the building connections with people yes. who can help you when you don't have the courage to protect against your own, um, uh, desire to say yes and, and to allow your boundaries to be crossed. Madupe, I've kept you from telling us about your book just because I keep geeking out about all the stuff that you know, and I kind of want to—I want to hear you, you tell me about leadership and culture and stress and the like. But it's time, so tell me what what book have you chosen for us today? So this is a little bit unusual, but I have chosen a chapter of the Bible. Interesting. Genesis now, chapter thirty-seven. 
Okay. Now, what 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 was it about this book and this this chapter that called you and made you want to read it for us? Okay. So the challenge is I now run and read, mm. which means that I don't get to do all my highlighting and whatever <laughs> of certain like two pages of a book that I love and all that. And I love reading. I have books over the decades that I loved. So I wasn't sure which book to choose. Mm -hmm. But then I said, well, what is a book that I actually go to regularly and that I remember stories from regularly from when I was a child? And that book was the Bible. My mom and my dad used to read us Bible stories and all that, and I loved them. I felt they were so engaging. So I said, let me go back to one of my favorites. And um, that's that's what I chose, Genesis chapter 37, which is about Joseph's dreams. Ooh. Madupe, please do read us uh, Genesis from the Bible. Thank you. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, in the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, his 17-year-old son, was taking care of the flocks with his brothers. Now he was a youngster working with the sons of Billah and Zilpah, his father's wives. Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was a son born to him late in life, and he made a special tunic for him. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated Joseph and were not able to speak to him kindly. Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. There we were, binding sheaves of grain in the middle of the field. Suddenly, my sheaf rose up and stood upright, and your sheaf surrounded my sheaf and bowed down to it. Then his brothers asked him, do you really think that you will rule over us or have dominion over us? They hated him even more because of his dream and because of what he said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Look, he said, I had another dream. The sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father and his brothers, his brothers rebuked him saying, what is this dream that you had? Will I, your mother, and your brothers really come and bow down to you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept in mind what Joseph had said. When his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem, Israel said to Joseph, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I will send you to them. I'm ready, Joseph replied. So Jacob said to him, go now and check on the welfare of your brothers and the flocks and bring me word. So Jacob sent him from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph reached Shechem, a man found him wandering in the field. So the man asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they're grazing their flocks. The man said, they left this area, for I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. Now Joseph's brothers saw him from a distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. They said to one another, here comes the master of dreams. Come now, let's kill him, throw him into one of the cisterns, and then say a wild animal ate him. Then we'll see how his dreams turn out. When Reuben heard this, he rescued Joseph from their hand saying, let's not take his life. Reuben continued, don't shed blood, throw him into the cistern that is here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this so he could rescue Joseph from them and take him back to his father. When Joseph reached his brothers, they stripped him of his tunic, the special tunic that he wore. Then they took him and threw him in the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. When they had sat down to eat their food, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were carrying spices, balm, and myrrh down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites but let's not lay a hand on him. For after all, he is our brother, our own flesh. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants passed by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out from the cistern and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. The Ishmaelites then took Joseph to Egypt. Later, Reuben returned to the cistern to find that Joseph was not in it. He tore his clothes, returned to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there and I, where can I go? So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a goat, and dipped the tunic in the blood. 
Then they brought the special tunic to their father and said, we found this. Determine now whether it's your son's tunic or not. He recognized it and exclaimed, it's my son's tunic. A wild animal has eaten him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters stood by him to console him, but he refused to be consoled. No, he said, I will go to the grave mourning my son. So Joseph's father wept for him. Now in Egypt, the Midianites sold Joseph to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. And great things happened that to Joseph after that. Well, quite frankly, Madupe, that sounded like an everyday yes. in, in many organizations I've been in. <laughs> so like, it's just an everyday politics of how it works yes. around here. But what was it about that story? Which is exactly why I chose it. Right. I mean, I just, I feel like it has all the ideas, like you said, that, that are in our everyday lives, jealousy, favoritism, you know, love, kindheartedness, lies, deceit, you know, <laughs> imagination. That's the other thing. Like this yeah. idea of this tunic, Yeah. you just imagine what does this tunic look like? Yeah. Um, and so it just makes you more creative. I mean, heck, after a, a musical was named after right. this whole episode. Um, and uh, so there's something about that that I love, but I also love the aspect of dreams. I've just been in this mode of, you know, what am I supposed to learn from my dreams? Right. How can I dream bigger? How can I dream differently? And um, it just shows that there's power in your dreams. And if you know how the rest of the story goes, yeah, those dreams kind of came to life <laughs> in an amazing way. And Indeed. so um, that's what made me choose that. I just... It, it, it just captures some of the key principles of how we live this life that we're given and some of them different emotions. And, yeah. um, and I just think it's fun. It's a fun story. So, Najupe, where do you go to dream? Mm, ooh, that's a good question because I um, – I wish I dreamt more. I just, you know, I'm not that much of a daydreamer, which is interesting. Yeah. But when I run, one of the I'm a runner. Yeah. And I feel like running allows me to have the freedom and the space to just think and to be and to dream and to imagine. Yeah. So that's one space in which I I dream. Um, I also do appreciate like putting my head down to bed and, <laughs> and trying to dreaming. see what comes out of it. Yeah literally dreaming. Yeah. Um, but I would say that running is one of the places where I, when I daydream um, and, and I love it and I want to do that more. I want to create more space in my life to, to dream a bit more. I also wonder kind of connected to that. Um, what fuels your ambition? I mean, if you think of dreaming as in what's possible for you in this world, you know, it already feels like you've achieved a great deal. Um, but, but you know, again, I don't know you, but I don't feel like you're kind of plateauing and going, good, my work here is done. I'll just relax now and kind of cruise. Um, I, I'm curious to know how you feed your ambition, how you stretch your ambition, how you, how you kind of take on an even bigger horizon perhaps. Mm. Oh, that's that's another good question. <laughs> You're throwing these goodies at me. They're hard. I'm sorry. They're difficult questions, but they're juicy. I, my dream right now is to just continue living life joyfully. Yeah. And I know that's that may sound, I don't know how it may sound, but it may sound interesting. I'll put it that way. But I went through a period where I had everything planned and everything you know, in two years, I'll do this. And in three years, I'll do this and blah, blah, blah. And I, that wasn't joyful. Yeah. I wasn't feeling joy. I wasn't feeling happiness. And so right now, when you say like, what are your ambitions? I just want to keep being inspired. I just want to keep learning. I just want to meet new people. Yeah. I want to feel like I have an impact and that I am able to 
let the light that I feel like God has given me and blessed me with shine on others in the same way that it's been shining on me. And that's my goal and my hope and my ambition. I don't have things, more things I want to accomplish. I'm good. Right. I, I, I'm good. There's, I am not in want of anything. I'd like to say I'm not thirsty for anything. What I am thirsty for um, is to just continue having a good time learning and growing yeah. and meeting great people and learning more about myself. I wish, I wish, I wish everybody had that. <laughs> that that sense of i'm i'm not and i think we all can yeah and i and i recognize that's a privilege you know and i do recognize it comes with age and and all that too but yeah i'm i i want to continue living in a way where i can appreciate what i have and not constantly strive and want and whatever because i have so much we all have so much we can't lose perspective of all that we have in search of these amorphous things that we think will bring us joy when they don't. Marupa, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, as, as, a, as a final question, can I ask you simply this? What, what needs to be said that hasn't yet been said in this conversation between you and me? Um, I'll say thank you. Uh, thank you for providing a space for us to just have a neat conversation. Um, thank you for allowing me to just choose a piece of me that I actually don't think that it was interesting even choosing the Bible. You know, I am a practicing Christian and, and I I like the principles of it, but I don't like wear that on my sleeve and I'm not like a Bible thumper or all these. So, but to be able to share something that, or a passage or a text that reminds me of my youth, spurred my love for short stories. And um, that is an important piece of me. Yeah, it was really meaningful. So I just want to end by saying thank you, and I enjoyed this conversation, and um, and I appreciate you asking me to do this. I mostly don't remember my dreams, but occasionally I have these kind of periods of time, little bursts where I do, and then honestly, it's just wild. And I'm in one of those periods right now. Just last night, and I appreciate this might be TMI, too much information. I dreamt I had been made President Biden's chief of staff, but then I had this thing with a cufflink going missing, which meant I missed a key meeting, and I think it all went downhill from there. So obviously, I have no idea what to make of that dream at all. But what's fantastic about dreams is that the stuff that happens, it's it's bonkers, and it's impossible, but it seems perfectly plausible, like it could happen. I guess that's what I like about, let's call it daylight or awake dreaming. This is when you're sitting there imagining, well, what's possible for me? Because when you're in that mode, there's a sense of permission. You know, as I said right at the introduction, this is the first podcast for the new year. And it's really a fine time to ask you. So what are you dreaming of? Not what are your resolutions? That's less interesting to me. But what are you dreaming of? What are you hungry for? What are you ambitious for? What are you longing for? What's calling you? What's the 10 times, the 10x version of the best thing you have right now? What does that mean? What does that look like? What does that taste like? If you like the conversation with Nimadupe, you you can guess I'm going to hark back to the two women I reintroduced you to at the start of the show, Dolly and Katie. So Dolly Chug's episode is called How and Why to Be Good-ish. That's number 20. And Katie Milkman's episode is called You Are Perfectly, uh, You Are Predictably Imperfect. It's appropriate that I stumbled over that. You Are Predictably Imperfect. That's episode number 27. If you'd like more about Madupe and her work, um, her website is the place to go to, Madupe Ekinola, or one word, M-O-D-U-P-E-A-K-I-N-O-L-A.com in the, in the reader's notes, at listening notes, of course. And there you'll find links to her LinkedIn and Twitter, X accounts, all of that good stuff, plus her, her publications and podcasts, some great speaker videos, the whole shebang. Thank you for listening. Thank you for loving the podcast. I'm wishing you the very best of a wonderful 2024. Um, if you want to start the year by giving the show a rating or recommending this episode to a friend, even better. But I will say you're awesome and you're doing great. <laughs>